Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Diana Delgado. I'm the literary director of the University of Arizona Poetry Center. Um, and I want to welcome everyone uh, to our inaugural episode of the Institute for Inquiry and Poetics. The Institute, founded at the University of Arizona Poetry Center, is a thought center designed to create space and time for poets to respond to pressing questions that reside at the intersection of social concern and poetry, encouraging interdisciplinary modalities and investigative research. The Institute will ask poets a series of questions and digitally archive their responses on poetry.arizona.edu. Today, I'm excited to host Leanne Howe, Jennifer Forrester, and Joy Harjo as part of this year's theme, Beyond the Obvious. And we're especially excited to explore how imaginative language and poetry can help create a sense of belonging. We're grateful to the Haran Connection Fund for partnering with the Poetry Center and for supporting this conversation today. In our program tonight, each poet will read for approximately 20 minutes sharing work from the anthology, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, a Norton anthology in Na of Native Nations poetry, an anthology that explores the same in um, interesting ways. And then after that reading, we'll be in conversation. Before we begin, the University of Arizona Poetry Center must acknowledge that we exist on the traditional homelands of the Ta'ana Odom, who have cared for these lands for centuries. And as a guest in these lands, I want to acknowledge that we are on occupied Ta'ana Odom territory. Now, I'd like to introduce Bojan Lewis, who will say a few words of introduction about the anthology, and who is a poet, friend, and assistant professor here in Arizona. Bojan Lewis Dene is the author of the poetry collection Currents, which received a 2018 American Book Award and the nonfiction chapbook Troubleshooting Silence in Arizona. He is, he is an assistant professor in the Creative Writing and American Indian Studies programs at the University of Arizona. Bojan, thank you for being here with us. Thank you. It's an, it's an honor. Um, yeah, so I prepared a few words. Um, so my first encounter with the Norton Anthology was in high school, Honors English, where the TA for the class gifted me his copy of Postmodern American Poetry which lacked, as many other anthologies have, any voice from Native nations. It would take some digging on my part and a university Native literature course to expose me to the ancestor and relative anthologies already in print. Ancestor and relative anthologies, terms that poet laureate Joy Harjo uses in the introduction to when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through, a beautiful, and sublime title for this paramount and necessary anthology. Like its ancestor and relative anthologies, terms I will wholeheartedly use and embrace in my pedagogy, this gathering of voices from the native nations of the US exemplifies and amplifies our stories, histories, and presence in the landscape and imagination of contemporary culture. As indigenous peoples, We've persevered through many instances of darkness and annihilation, uh, but we've never stopped singing, telling story, or harnessing the strength of our voices. The brilliant writers and editors of this anthology, Joy Harjo, Leanne Howe, and Jennifer Elise Forrester, as well as the contributing editor relatives, deserve nothing less than our admiration, respect, and deep appreciation for the continuance of light. It is with humility and honor that I am able to introduce when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through a Norton anthology of Native Nations poetry. Thank you, Bojan. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to uh, introduce our first reader, uh, Leanne Howe. Um, Leanne Howe is an enrolled citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. She is the Eitzen Distinguished Professor of American Literature and English at the University of Georgia. Howe is the author of novels, plays, and poetry and screenplays. She is the on-camera narrator for a 90-minute PBS documentary, Indian Country Diaries, Spiral of Fire, 2006, and producer and writer for the 56-minute Searching for Sequoia, airing in 2021. Her third film collaboration with Ojibwe filmmaker and director James N. Fortier. Howe's awards include 
the American Book Award, Western Literature Association's 2015 Distinguished Achievement Award, the inaugural 2014 MLA Prize for Studies in Native American Literature, and a 2012 United States Artist Board Fellowship, among others. During the Arab Spring 2010-2011, Howe was a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Jordan, Amman. Her book, Savage Conversations, Coffee House Press 2019, if you have not read that, please grab that soon. L love that book. Um, is a story of Mary Todd Lincoln and the savage Indian that Mary claimed tortured her nightly in 1875, which has been staged as a play in New York City, Seattle, and in Athens, Georgia. Two major anthologies released in August are Famine Pots, the Choctaw Irish Gift Exchange, 1847 to Present, by Michigan State University Press, released in August 2020, co-edited by Howe and Irish scholar Padraig Kerwin, and When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, a Norton anthology of Native Nations poetry, the groundbreaking anthology covering two centuries of Native poetry, which we will be hearing from, edited by U.S. Poet Laureate Joy Harjo, Leanne Howe, and Jennifer Elise Forster. Both books appeared in August 2020. She is at work on a new book set in Stonewall, Oklahoma. Thank you, Leanne, for being here with us today, and I welcome you with gratitude and hope. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm, I'm really honored to be here and be among friends. I think um, I've, I've known you all for so many years and I feel like I'm with family and especially um, lately working on the anthology. Um, when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. I think Joy and I and um, Jennifer met for um, uh, at least every two to three weeks throughout the year preceding its finished um, and finishing the work. And so, um, I, I mean, this is this is as as Bojan said. This is a um, um, an enormous undertaking to pull two centuries of work from poets, native poets across the United States, <clears throat> and it was in and the way I feel about it is that it's sacred work, really, especially our ancestor poets and. Um, it, so I'm um, I'm sometimes uh, discovering new things. I mean, we uh, in reading the book, it's just a it feels like a discovery every day. So I'm um, again I'm delighted to be here um, today. While I was <clears throat> on the internet, I uh, received a call uh, from the AIW for papers about land is our first teacher. It's a conference that will go on in um, uh, First Nations in Canada this next year. Um, land is our first teacher. And this was something that was built into our discussions about putting the anthology together. It's region by region by region, land by land. Um, and I've written a great deal about that, and land is um, is our first teacher, our first gardeners, women work the land, our first mound builders, architects in the southeast, um, created spaces on the land for teaching, and for living, and so uh, so. Land has meant a great deal to all of our tribes and all of our people. And um, so it also continued to guide us in putting this anthology together, uh, almost like a guiding hand. The land helped us bring this work into being. So I want to read today um, uh, a poem by Mose Jumper called Simplicity. So if you have the book, it's on page 394, if you want to follow along. The small tunnel, which the rabbit uses for escape and travel. The small imprints of a killdeer 
in the soft white sand near the pond. The fragileness of the newborn doves and how the mother puts on an act to lure away approaching enemies. The unity of the small minnows as they protect themselves by straying near the shoreline of the stream. The clear whistling sound of the scorpion makes to let one know he's near. The shagginess of owl's nest and the neatness of the hummingbirds, the long graceful jumps of the sleek green frog, the short choppy hops of the lumpy toad, the agileness and grace of the otter, the awkward wing flapping of the crane, the camouflage nest of the mobile alligator, and the will to reach the water of her young. The winding tunnels that lead to nowhere of the sly red fox. The abundance of life in the wet season and stench of the death in the dry. The persistence of the mother hawk to nudge her young to make that flight. I saw all these things and many more and I know they were right. So that's one of my favorite poems from the Southeast section. Um, Moses Jumper is a Seminole poet. And, um, and the Seminole Nation is, I don't know, about 30 miles from my home in Ada, Oklahoma. So I pass by there uh, when I'm home in the summers, probably twice a week. And um, so this just, the Southeastern section are from poets in all the places I grew up with, mostly. And um, I would like to read um, a poem by Laura Mann. She's Choctaw. Um, and this is from page 416. And she's writing about the Naniwaya Cave, which is um, a very sacred place in the land in, uh, along the Pearl River in Mississippi. So I'm just going to read from her poem. <clears throat> a very long time ago, the first creation of men was in the Naniwaya, and they were made there, and they came forth. And the Choctaws came out of the Naniwaya. And then they sunned themselves on the earthen rampart. And when they got dry, they did not go anywhere, but settled down on this very land. And it is the Choctaw home. And that's by Isaac Pizantabi. And uh, uh, so now I'll read her poem. A couple of miles down this iron locked road is a low cave in a large mound. Dad throws rocks inside the gate. We hear shallow water. He crawls through the opening, flashlight in hand. I am scared of underground places, can't follow. There is room for four grown men to stand, he echoes. I stay where I can see what's around me, kudzu draped trees, old growth in the shadows. I can almost see what's inside their stories. But they're tight-lipped, and I take my leave. Take my lesson, sorry. Picnic tables, grills, beer cans surround the mound. Even though it's miles away from any town, no sign, not on a map, just numbered country road, I can see people still come here. Dad crawls out, throws a burnt log onto the ground. I want to go inside, shuffle, head down, knees up, into the entrance, but can't go any farther. Instead, I grab a handful of wet cave dirt wall, mossy green, replace it, with, replace it with my hair. I clutch this dirt gift, nails in palms, head pulsing heat from pain. 
this place he's taken me, this shadow world requires both of us. We had to come to our source, go in, come back out renewed. But I'm not done with this past yet. Can't end it and reemerge. My head is burning in shadows. And uh, for Choctaws, the Nani Y represents not only our birth mound, our mother mound, but also the sacred place that Choctaws crawled up out of um, and became people. And that's the story we've been told um, for generations. So I think um, I'm going to read something I think is really funny. Um, and we've made, um, with an animator, Jonathan Thunder, made a couple of these, this poem into uh, animation. And, um, and then another one on Noble Savage learns to tweet. So I'm going to read from one of my own uh, works. It's called Noble Savage Sees a Therapist. And I've written a whole series of these, and one of these days I'm going to put them together. But they, they always make me laugh when I think about the noble savage. Um, okay, noble savage sees a therapist. Noble savage. She's too intense for me, and I feel nothing. No emotion. In fact, I'm off all females even lost my lust for attacking white chicks. Pause. Therapist. He rides furiously on a yellow pad, but says nothing. Noble savage. People expect me to be strong, wise, stoic, without guilt. A man capable of a few symbolic acts. Ugh. Is that what I'm supposed to say? Therapist. He continues writing. Noble Savage. I don't feel like maiming, scalping, burning wagon trains. I'm developing hemorrhoids from riding bareback. It's an impossible role. The truth is I'm conflicted. I don't know who I am. What should I do, Doc? therapist. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Let's take this up during our next visit. Thank you. Yoko K. Thank you so much, um, Dan, uh, for your descriptions um, and sort of information about the anthology and also reading the work of some really um, amazing poets. Um, so thank you so much. Gracias. Um, we're now going to go on to our next reader, um, who is Jennifer Elise Forrester. Jennifer Elise Forrester received her PhD in English and Literary Arts at the University of Denver, her MFA from the Vermont College of Fine Arts, and is an alumna of the Institute for American Indian Arts, IAIA, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She has received an NEA Creative Writing Fellowship, a Lannan Foundation Writing Residency Fellowship, a grant from the Ann Instantia F Foundation, and was a Wallace Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford. Jennifer is the author of two books of poetry, Leaving Tulsa, 2013, and Bright Raft in the Afterweather, 2018, both published by the University of Arizona Press. She teaches for the IAIA MFA in Creative Writing Program and the Rainier Writing Workshop and serves as a literary assistant to the U.S. Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo. The daughter of an Air Force diplomat, Forster grew up living internationally, is of European, German, Dutch, and Muskogee descent, and is a member of the Muskogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma. She lives in, France, San, excuse me, she lives in San Francisco. Thank you, Jennifer, for being here with us today, and I just want to welcome you with, with, with just an open heart. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much um, for having us all here today and Bojan for the introduction. I'm really excited about this Institute for Inquiry and Poetics. Um, I just, I think the idea of reframing our future through imaginative language is 
well, it's what we need to do. So thank you for all the work you're doing towards that. Absolutely. It's, it's been such a pleasure to participate in the making of this anthology um, and to talk a bit today about the anthology within the framework of belonging um, and how language can bring us to that kind of belonging. So I'm gonna read some poems from the anthology that I feel really connected to because they are about belonging when you're somewhat in an in-between space, which I think all humans are, um, but particularly in this country, Native people. And just on a personal level for me, since I, um, daughter of a military diplomat, growing up mostly in Europe, I spent more years in Europe than I did the United States. Um, I kind of grew up in the borderlands of identity. Um, my father's family has a deep Dutch New York history dating back to the Revolutionary War, as well as German ancestry. Um, I lived in Austria as a kid, so I was really able to connect to kind of that German culture and language. My mother's family is rooted and centralized in Oklahoma's Muskogee history, which I was connected to during the summer when my sister and I were sent home to the U.S. to live with our grandparents and cousins. So I, I grew up understanding about this conflicted national and cultural identity. I also grew up understanding that homeland is a place of loss as much as it is a place to be found. My family stories of our ancestors on all sides were always a part of our identity, and I'm grateful for that connectedness. So when I began writing seriously, I sought my own literary ancestors, the concept Joy Harjo has graciously named and encouraged among all of us. I grew up reading, as many of us probably did, Norton anthologies and learning the literary traditions of the United States as a realm occupied primarily by Englishmen with a few upper class women dotting the periphery. I did not find my literary ancestors in Whittier or Bradstreet, Whitman or Thoreau. So when my mom gave me Joy Harjo's book of poetry as a young teenager and told me this was a poet from our same nation, I knew the story of American literature was incomplete as I had learned it. I knew there were other Muskogee writers, other native women writers. There were so many literary ancestors hidden in the poems under the palimpsests of writers who had erased them. One of these literary ancestors I came across and I knew she was foundational for me um, is Jane Johnston Schoolcraft. Um, and she is included in this anthology, of course. Um, here she is here. So Jane Johnson Schoolcraft, and forgive me if I mispronounce her name, Bamawawa Gijikowe, Woman of the Stars Rushing Through the Sky, is Anishinaabe poet born in 1800 in Salt St. Marie. Her father was an Irish fur trader um, and her mother was the daughter of an Anishinaabe leader and locally respected storyteller. Jane was educated at home with her siblings by their father who had an extensive collection of classical and English literature. Jane is primarily known through her marriage to Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, the first U.S. ethnographer. While both were writers, Jane's work was quickly erased from the landscape of 19th century literature. Little was known about her work or her family's influence on Henry's writings. It wasn't until 2002 when a handbound manuscript of her poetry was discovered in a box in the Illinois State Historical Library and taken up into serious scholarly study by Robert Dale Parker, that the scope of her writings and influence became evident. Parker gathered her work for the first time into a book form. And thanks to that, we were able to find a lot of her work for this anthology. Um, we also found several translations. She wrote in English and Ojibwe, Anishinaabe Moween, and Margaret Newden is one poet who helped us translate her work. Jane wrote at least 50 poems in both English and Ojibwe between 1815 and 1842. She also wrote at least eight stories in English prose, authored a number of nonfiction prose pieces of her own, and translated and transcribed many Anishinaabe Moin songs and other oral texts. Um, during her lifetime, she was actually pretty well known within the small circle um, because she and her husband produced a, a magazine called The Literary Voyager. And actually, it was through this magazine that a lot of her work came out at the time, and she made a pretty big influence on a number of writers, notably Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who based his Song of Hiawatha on her stories. But of course, her name became erased among with the names of so many Native authors and writers, particularly women in the 19th century. So the poem I'm going to read from the anthology is called To the Pine Tree. While Jane was homeschooled in both English literature and Anishinaabe language and culture as a child, 
the family sent her to Ireland in 1809 to complete her education. Uh, but she was homesick and fell ill and came home pretty quickly thereafter. Um, she wrote this poem to the pine tree as a reflection of that trip and her homecoming. And she wrote it in Anishinaabe Moin and English, and it's also been translated into different English versions by herself as well. So this is just one version of the translation. The pine, the pine, I eager cried. The pine, my father, see it stand at first, as first that cherished tree I spied returning to my native land. The pine, the pine, oh lovely scene, the pine that is forever green. Ah, beauteous tree, ah, happy sight that greets me on my native strand and hails me with a friend's delight to my own dear bright motherland. Oh, tis to me a heart sweet scene, the pine, the pine that's ever green. Not all the trees of England bright, not Aaron's lawns of green and light are half so sweet to memory's eye as this dear type of northern sky. Oh, tis to me a heart sweet scene, the pine, the pine that ever greens. I find myself connected to Jane as a literary ancestor because of her in-betweenness, a writer balancing two worlds, two languages, and at times, two continents. I also find myself in the melancholy of her private poems, the solace that she found in the land. Despite her in-betweenness, she always found herself whole in the land, as she tells us in the poem, To the Pine Tree. Another Native woman writer pre-20th century included in this anthology that I find myself connected to is Emily Pauline Johnson. Johnson was born and raised on the Grand River Reservation of the Six Nations near Brantford, Ontario in 1861. She was the daughter of George Henry Martin Johnson, a Mohawk chief who worked to mediate between the Mohawks and whites and advocated to prevent the illegal trade of alcohol in the reservation. Pauline's British mother, Emily Susanna Howells, educated her in the English Romantics, which served to influence her poetry. Pauline wrote in multiple genres, including adult fiction and children's stories. She also made a living as a stage performer. While her stage performance afforded her a living, her writings earned her respect as a mediator between Iroquois and white worlds. Many 20th century critics, however, have commented on the Victorian romanticism of her work, using this claim to denounce both her talent and her authenticity as an Indian writer. This criticism was leveraged against almost all published American Indian authors of the 19th and early 20th centuries and reflects not only a racism as it enforces a version of authenticity developed by the non-native world out of one could argue a pastoral desire for an idealized other. Pauline was educated under the tutelage of her British born mother just as Jane was raised amidst her white father's library of English literature. Yet both were also raised and educated by their traditional tribal communities and maintained both worlds in their work. We can find in Johnson's poetry a great deal of influence from romantic versification, while at the same time a persistence of themes related to her indigenous identity and history. We can also find an interesting twist on the pastoral tradition that appears throughout her poetry. She too is a writer of the borderland, a mediator of the in-between. Her elegies for the loss of Iroquois and Mohawk culture simultaneously affirm the culture's powerful continuation. Her poem, Marshlands, is one of my favorites for its contemplative tone. It is also, like Jane's poem, attuned to the natural world as a place of solace, where one is in the in-between, and in that in-between, one can find themselves belonging. This poem, to me, speaks about belonging, the grounding that poetry and the natural world can return us to. So this poem by Emmeline Pauline Johnson is called Marshlands. A thin wet sky that yellows at the rim and meets with sun lost lip the marsh's brim. The pools low lying dank with moss and mold glint through their mildews like large cups of gold. Among the wild rice in the still lagoon, in monotone the lizard shrills his tune. The wild goose homing seeks a sheltering where rushes grow and oozing lichens cling, 
late cranes with heavy wing and lazy flight sail up the silence with the nearing night and like a spirit swathed in some soft veil steals twilight in its shadows o'er the swale hushed lie the sedges and the vapors creep thick gray and humid while the marshes sleep I love that part of the poem about the wild goose homing seeks a sheltering and how sheltered the poet feels in the writing of the poem in the sleeping marshes. I'm going to read one by uh, Darcy McNichol. Um, and this one um, I want to read because it's an example of the liminality of language and how language can return us to a sense of homeland as a place of being in between. As we all know, indigenous homelands in this country have endured a violent mapping and languaging. And poetics, I believe, can become a way of remapping. Many of the poems in this anthology critique the imperial notion of the land as something to be possessed for the purpose of actualizing individualistic power. This national striving to possess and delimit is comparable to the way we strive through language to define. Poetry turns against this impulse, spiraling, drawing, and retracting location and possession. Poetry does not define or answer. It exists in the open landscape of the question. It looks both ways into the past and the future. In Darcy McNichols' poem, we can see the poem embracing not knowing, um, being lost, and finding a homeland internally in the very journey of seeking. Darcy McNichol um, was born in 1904, Metis and Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. He was an author and a community organizer. Um, he was born and raised in St. Ignatius, Montana. So this poem is called, Man Hesitates But Life Urges. There is this shifting endless film and I have followed it down the valleys and over the hills, pointing with a wavering finger when it disappeared in purple forest patches with its ruffle and wave to the slightest breathing wind god. There is this film seen suddenly far off when the sun walking to his setting turns back for a last look. And out there on the far, far prairie, a lonely drowsing cabin catches and holds a glint for one how endless moment in a staring window the fire and song of the martyrs. There is this film that has passed to my fingers and I have trembled afraid to touch and in the eyes of one who had wanted to give what I had asked but hesitated, tried and then came with a weary aged not quite I could but see that single realmless point of time, all that is sad and tired and old and endless shifting film. And I went again down the valleys and over the hills, pointing with wavering finger, ever reaching to touch, trembling, ever fearful to touch. I think this poem is a good example of the retracing of land that can happen through language. In this poem, the narrator speaks from a state of displacement and placement at once. He stays present in the middle space, seeing but not quite seeing, on a way somewhere but not arriving. Healing, I believe, is not something we arrive at. It is a space of transformation we must transit through. The poem reminds me of that space. It is a poem about the conditions of that liminality, which is also the space of healing. I'm gonna finish with a poem uh, by a good friend, Janice Gould. Um, and I wanna say something I've been thinking a lot about and written about a lot is this idea of in seeing. Because um, so much of the language of the United States is kind of languaging over the language of where we come from, the, his, the, the real stories of this land. Um, and so when we look to the land, we often don't see ourselves on the maps as things are defined. 
So we have to learn how to see with invisible maps. And this kind of in-seeing I think is distinct um, from seeing form or relationship or order. It's not referential. It doesn't say or name. It doesn't draw the boundaries or define. Um, it's a way of insight. Um, it's a way of remembering place internally. Um, it's a visibility in a way that holds love as evidence of our con continuation. Um, and that's really why I wanted to read Janice Gould's poem, Earthquake Weather. Um, in this poem by Janice Gould, um, who has incredible work and left us too early in June 2019, I hear the words of a poet who has the knowledge and insight of love, the love that exists by inseam. Um, Janice Gould was a good friend, a teacher, um, and a Konkau Maidu poet born and raised in Berkeley. As it is autumn and fire season in California, I wanted also to share this poem for all who are suffering from the many losses to not lose faith in love. This is called Earthquake Weather. It's earthquake weather in California, that hazy stillness along the coast just before the Santa Ana's howl out of the east, hot and dry. There were days in September when we drove down the fault line south of Hayward. We went where there were Spanish names, Sanyol and Calaveras, La Mission de San Jose. I remember seeing the cells of the Padres, their faded vestments, the implements of wood and iron. We were looking for another country, something not North America. A taste, a smell, a solitary image. The eucalyptus on a bleached hill, its blue pungent leaves made you long for another home. That was what you wanted from me to be your other home, your other country. Being Indian, I was your cholo from the Bolivian highlands. I was your boy full of stone and a cold sunset. At night, seated at your bedside, I was remote. I often made you weep, you in the guise of an angelita. You lay on the low mattress, a weaving beneath your head and watched me with your slow eyes your sadness. When September comes with its hot electric winds, I will think of you and know somewhere in the world, the earth is breaking open. And, and I, I forgot to, I was supposed to read one of my own. So um, I'll read a short one. <laughs> um, I was thinking so Thank you so much, Leanne Howe, for allowing me to be published in the Georgia Review last spring with a special Southeastern um, issue. And they accepted this poem, which is really kind of a, about in seeing and looking at the maps of the Southeast and not seeing our Muscogee, seeing our Muscogee homelands there, but through a different kind of visibility, a different kind of insight. Um, so this is from the Georgia Review. Um, it's from a long collection, so it's just a, it's just a section. I find you nowhere that is here or there, below the sunken Yuchi path, iron ore, the ridge dividing water veined with it, pea vine, wire grass, short leaf hickory, old fields, flood plains, indigo dyed, when the woods were still dense, saw palmetto, grapes of the hills destroyed by fire and the haw chestnut by the hatchet. If it were easy to leave our bodies in the fork of Red River, two mounds of earth. If it were easy to leave you behind in a stream clear with flowering stones, to find you in the language where I lost you, as if you were a sentence in this poem, and this poem an archive of the forest. But I've burned the remaining pine. On the bluffs, strawberries thinly scattered and in the old beaver ponds, briar root, a bread made of it for times of famine. Thank you all so much. Wow, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was really beautiful, not only to hear your poem, but then also to hear the other poems that you selected and, and the reasons why, um, and connecting that to this idea of belonging. 
um, and not belonging. Um, so thank you for that. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm now going to introduce, um, with honor, <laughs> um, Joy Harjo. Um, Joy Harjo's nine books of poetry include An American Sunrise, Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings, How We Became Human, New and Selected Poems, and She Had Some Horses. Harjo's memoir, Crazy Brave, won several awards, including the Penn USA Literary Award for Creative Nonfiction and the American Book Award. She co-edited two anthologies of contemporary Native women's writing, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, and Reinventing the Enemy's Language, Native Women's Writing of North America, one of the London Observer's Best Books of 1997. She is the recipient of the Ruth Lilly Prize from the Poetry Foundation for Lifetime Achievement, the 2015 Wallen Stevens Award from the Academy of American Poets for Proven Mastery in the Art of Poetry, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America, and the United States Artist Fellowship. In 2014, she was inducted into the Oklahoma Writers Hall of Fame, a renowned musician Harjo performs with her saxophone nationally and internationally, solo and with her band, The Aerodynamics. She has five award-winning CDs of music, including the award-winning album, Red Dreams, A Trail Beyond Tears and Winding Through the Milky Way, which won a Native American Music Award for Best Female Artist of the Year in 2009. Harjo's latest is a book of poetry from Norton and American Sunrise. In 2019, Joy Harjo was appointed the 23rd United States Poet Laureate, the very first Native American to hold the position. She lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you, Joy, for being with us here today. And it is beyond an honor to introduce you here um, in, in our forum today. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and, and, and virtually to in Tucson, though I'm not, I'm actually. <laughs> Also, right now, the Muskogee Creek Nation Reservation. <laughs> you know, but uh, anyway, it's it's great to be here, and and I think about this anthology is make you know it's many things to many people to many people, and, and it's you know and especially for Native peoples. But it's it says the even the existence of it says that we belong to American literature. We are part of American literature. We are, you know, the roots, you know, you'll find the roots of American poetry here in these pages. Um, I'm going to begin, and even the beginning, at the beginning, in the introduction, we say, we begin with the land. And that's true for everyone, does it? You know, we acknowledge that as indigenous peoples because our cultures are still, we uh, did not turn our backs. We are so, um, um, embedded here, you know, our, we're, we were, we were uh, appointed keepers of these, of these particular lands. But it's hard to figure out where to start. Every time I open the anthology, there's something else that I, even though we, you know, we've edited it, we've read, and at one point, and at one point during the final editing process, Leanne, Jennifer, and I read the whole book aloud. Because ultimately language, whether it's, you know, the roots are oral, the, you know, out of the oral tradition and poetry, you know, is essentially oral. I think of books of poetry as really oral events. And um, so I, I keep finding, I keep finding things in here. I'm going to start with one, and I've gone back and forth on it. In fact, I did a whole new order of poems. So we were, you know, sitting here, and then I think, yeah, I might revert to what I have. But I, I hesitated with this one because I don't, I don't think the translation is up to the Yupik part. And but I can't say that I am not a Yupik speaker. But I can see the end words in the Yupik part, but it's called Prayer Song Asking for a Whale. And I think about the roots of, Amer you know, of American poetry and the roots of poetry in which we exist in a realm in which we're absolutely interdependent with earth 
we are earth there's this interdependence and so what we speak and and how we move about has everything to do with is embedded in that relationship so um and you know and in you know in poetry it's it's uh you know we speak poetry is is kind of the closest to po power language that we have because you're so exact and we use poetry to speak really what can't be spoken you know we go use poetry to go beyond words of course which is ironic because we have to use words absolutely precisely like a harpoon in a way you might want to say it in that way to get to where to get to where we're going even beyond language we want our poet poetry demands that we speak beyond language so i think of this prayer song asking for a whale and thinking of it's a prayer song but our po i think of my poems a lot of them as songs that ultimately poetry music and uh, the roots of music the roots of poetry always lead to music always lead to dance and then I think about this relationship because this what this poem prayer song says is that there's a really you can't ask uh, you can't uh, do a prayer song asking for a whale without there being some kind of relationship and so I, I'm going to read the poem in English this is before I'll just read the little part here and I have a special connection I want to say to St. Lawrence Island I have not been there. I always meet people from there, you think, and there's always, I have met several people and then whalers, and I wanted to honor them by trying to at least acknowledge them in this, in this place. And one time I had a, a person from St. Lawrence Island bring me whale from their whale meat all the way to Santa Fe to, um, and we sat in the hotel room, with uh i brought some blueberries from the grocery store <laughs> and she had her ulu and we sat there on the floor of the hotel room and it was wonderful eating eating um muktuk and and berries and thanking the whale i mean i was so deeply honored so i want to read this poem too because of that occasion because really i mean is and i think what this whole book through throughout the book illustrates is that that relate it's that relationship it's not some kind of um you know new agey thing this is absolutely essential as we're seeing now with climate change with the with the earth responding with fires the super storms that we see tornadoes that you know are 10 20 times as as strong as they used to be when i was a child before the whaling season the boat captain would sing ceremonial songs in the evening the ceremony of singing was called Uvakuluk. I'm uh, probably not saying it right. The, cap the boat captain would sing these songs in such a low, reverent voice that you could hardly make out the words. And that's because he was singing as close as he could in English to whale songs. Especially before the whaling season began, the songs of petition were sung to God in a powerful, prayerful, pleading voice. The time is almost here, the season of the deep blue sea, bringing good things from the deep blue sea, whale of distant ocean, may there be a whale, may it indeed come within the waves. The time is almost here, the season of the deep blue sea, bringing good things from the deep blue sea, walrus of distant ocean, may there be a whale, may it indeed come within the waves. The time is almost here, the season of the deep blue sea, bringing good things in the deep blue sea. Bearded seal of distant ocean, may there be a whale, may it indeed come within the waves. I would just love to. So I went on an expedition to find, to try to find this song or find a singing of it. I could not find it. I could not find one, but, um, Anyway, a lot of our poems are like that. I think all, many of our poems, whether they're in the English language or any other language, nine, probably 96% of the world's poems are love poems, 
bring me this man, <laughs> bring me this woman, you know, or, or, you know, falling apart, make them go away. <laughs> you know, I see somebody else over the horizon, <laughs> you know, or bring us food or, or praising the plants. I mean, think about it. That winds through, so intrinsically through all poetry, you know, our place in the seasons, where we are, the plants around us, you know, it's it's all it's also intertwined, and um, and of course he sings that you have to sing it from a place of belonging. You have to belong to the sea. You know you have to belong to the whale, and so on. Okay, the next poem I was I am. I'm going to read a poem by Hanani K. Trask called "An Agony of Place." And um, I miss Hanani Kay. She's still around, but I haven't seen her in a long time. And uh, she's Kanaka Mali, Hawaiian, uh, my generation. Uh, really known for her, her scholarship and her um, activism as a native Hawaiian. And one of the leaders of the Hawaiian sovereignty movement and uh, has written monographs and, uh, and this wonderful uh, book from a native daughter, Colonialism and Sovereignty in Hawaii, and um, two books of poetry. So, and she helped found there at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, the Kamaka Kuakalani Center for Hawaiian Studies. And, uh, you know, the Hawaiian Islands, like this whole country, was, is occupied. This was occupied by American businessmen who uh, saw an opportunity and they dethroned the queen. They took over the islands very, not that long ago. And uh, so this is her poem, An Agony of Place, which is considered paradise. And millions of tourists go there with no, they, without knowing anything of the place. and, and the tourism industry, even though it brings income for um, for the American businessmen, <laughs> uh, the land suffers and the people suffer. An agony of place. There is always this sense, a wash of earth, rain, palm light falling across ironwood, sands fine and blowing to an ancient sea. I hear them always with fish hooks and nets, dark, long, red canoes gliding thoughtlessly to sea. And the still lush hills of laughter buried in secret caves, bones of love and ritual and sacred life. A place for the mano, the pueo, the o'o, and the smooth flat pohaku for a calabash of stars flung over the Pacific. And yet, our love suffers with a heritage of beauty in a land of tears, where our people go blindly, servants of another race, a culture of machines grinding vision from the eye, thought from the hand, until a tight silence descends wildly in place. Let's see. I was going to read Simplicity by Moses Jumper. That's one of my <laughs> favorite, that's one of my favorite poems. I might read it again, but uh, let's see. I love that poem because it's, um, it's about one of my favorite places, the Swan, the Everglades and about, I love the way in that poem, I'll just say this, I probably don't have to read it again, but I love the way that there is an equal weight to every creature. There's the little jumpy toad and the frog and the different animals that everyone is part, everyone is part of that simplicity or that, that place where you go out into the Everglades and you stop out there and, and there you are in the, that world of everybody. And it's so beautiful. And I, so I love to be reminded of it. Uh, let's see. That's probably why it's one of my favorite play. It's one of my favorite poems in the anthology because I can go to that poem and by reading that poem, I am in the Everglades. 
And I go there any chance I can get is to go out there and listen and be there, you know, with the, with, uh, the rest of the family. Maybe I'll read um, instead. So then I'll read, um, I was thinking um, Elise Passion's poem. I might need help finding it because I didn't decide to read this until just a while ago. I think I know where it is here. This poem, yeah, and I, I don't have the pronunciation right. The least passion is, is Osage. Um, I met her when she was um, an executive director of Poetry Society of America. And she really, she is the person, and I don't think most people really know this, but she is the one that there were no natives ever as part of those organizations, Academy of American Poets, Poetry Society. When I was coming up as a young poet, you never saw natives. We were never included in any of the programming. We were, we just were not present. And when she became executive director of Poetry Society of America, suddenly there were natives. And it was because of her that natives began to really get to be part of that, you know, of the American poetry scene at those in those kinds of organizations. So I want to thank her for that. And like I said, I don't think most people know that. Um, and I remember she uh, brought uh, Lucy Tapahanzo and I to to England to read. And uh, so she teaches right now at the MFA program at the School of Art, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I'm excited about a book manuscript. She's I've been reading some of the poems of a new manuscript and uh, of poetry. A lot of it about the uh, the oil murders at Osage. She had wanted to do a book. I think she even went to Chicago. She had a fellowship at the what is the name of that the Darcy McNichols Center at the What's the name of that organization? That the library. I, Leanne, I can't hear you. At Newberry yeah. Library. Yeah, at the Newberry Library. Thank you. But this was um, the title of the book that that um, someone did write about the Osage oil murders. It's being made into a movie called Killer of the Flowers Moon. The title came from this poem. White guy. Yeah, this is Anna Kyle Brown Osage, 1896 to 1921, Fairfax, Oklahoma. Because she died where the ravine falls into water. Because they dragged her down to the creek. In death, she wore her blue broadcloth skirt. Though frost blanketed the grass, she cooled her feet in the spring. Because I turned the log with my foot. Her slippers floated downstream into the dam because after the thaw, the hunters discovered her body because she lived without our mother, because she had inherited the head rights for oil beneath the land. She was carrying his offspring. The sheriff disguised her death as whiskey poisoning because when he carved her body up, he saw the bullet hole in her skull because when she was murdered, the leg clutchers bloomed, but then froze under the weight of frost during the killer of the flower's moon. I will wade across the river of the blackfish, the otter, the beaver. I will climb the bank where the willow never dies. There's a, simp a uh, comparative layering in this poem too, just as there is in uh, Moses Jumper Jr.'s poem, Simplicity a kind of layer, layering of natural detail towards this very unnatural death by those thieves, by thieves. I guess I should close then with uh, one of my poems. I'll read Running. And in a way, I think it is, um, I mean, the poem is about us. It's a struggle with history. 
and how historic trauma comes down through families and generations. But again, I think in a way, she, the speaker becomes, kind of returns to that place in a way. At least I see her doing that. Maybe the poem doesn't lead you there. I'm not going to take apart my own poem right here. <laughs> because I could, is, um, goes back. That's what I used to do when I would get in places when I was younger and I would get into this place of chaos. You know, I guess some people eat and sit in front of Netflix and, you know, others do other things. And I was never a, like a runner runner, but I remember people running after me. I would just go running. It might be two in the morning or it might be, I would just run because I just couldn't do any, I couldn't do it anymore. I would just, I would let go and I would run. Running. It's closing time. Violence is my boyfriend with a cross to bear. Hoisted on by the church, he wears it everywhere. There are no female deities in the Trinity. I don't know how I'm going to get out of here, said the flying fish to the tree. Last call. We've had it with history, we who look for vision here in the Indian and poetry bars somewhere to the left of hell. Now I have to find my way when there's a river to cross and no boat to get me there. When there appears to be no home at all. My father gone, chased by the stepfather's gun. Get out of here. I found my father at the bar. His ghost at least some piece of him in this sorry place. The boyfriend's convincing to a crowd. Right now he's the spell of attraction. What tales he tells in the fog of thin hope. I wander this sad world we've made with the enemy's words. The lights quiver like they do when the power is dwindling to a dangling stream. It's time to go home. We are herded like stoned cattle, like children for the bombing drill. Out the door into the dark streets of this old Indian town where there are no Indians anymore. I was afraid of the dark because then I could see everything. The truth with its eyes staring back at me. The mouth of the dark with its shiny moon teeth. No words, just a hiss and a snap. I could hear my heart hurting with my in the dark ears. I thought I could take it. Where was the party? It's been a century since we left home with the American soldiers on our backs. The party had long started up in the parking lot. He flew through the dark, broke my stride with a punch. I went down and came up. I thought I could take being a girl with her heart in her arms. I carried it for justice. For the rights of all Indians, we all had that cross to bear. Those old ones followed me, the quiet girl with the long dark hair, the daughter of a warrior who wouldn't give up. I wasn't ready yet to fling free the cross. I ran and I ran through the 2 a.m. streets. It was my way of breaking free. I was anything but history. I was the wind. Thank you, Joy. That was beautiful, um, especially to hear your work at the very end. It was, I've never heard that poem read aloud by you and it was, it was amazing. So thank you so much everyone for just being here tonight um, in conversation. Um, it was an amazing reading and I'm really excited to ask you a few questions. Um, so tonight's program um, is being supported by the Haran Connection Fund. And it's a new fund that was started in Tucson this past year. And the fund is designed to bring people together across differences and to use art and creativity as a means to connect. It's rooted in the Jewish values of, of justice, humanism, and love. Can you talk a little bit about how poetry can be a site for justice and or how this anthology might work to connect people? I mean, where do you start with, I'll, I'll start, I don't even know where to start with justice because even the act of writing as indigenous peoples, that's an act for justice. And even in my poem running, <laughs> you know, that yeah. was, you know, we were all 
that was my primary impulse for writing poetry when I first began writing was not like everybody else I know who wanted to be a writer from the time they were five years old. For me, it was being part of the Native rights movements. And then you can see that also in uh, Elise Passion's poem. You know, that poem came about absolutely for <clears throat> the site. Yeah, the, the, the place where, um, uh, you know, a, a tribal member was, ki you know, was killed for, to steal her land. You know, that poem was to bring back, was to actually replicate the site. The poem, ab ab you know, replicates the site and says here, this is what happened. You know, this is what happened. This was a woman. You know, she has a family. You know, this is what she was wearing. These are the lands, these lands where she probably came down here many times and these lands fed her spirit and they're a part of us. And, and this is, you know, this is the site. The poem actually, in a way, becomes, you know, reenacts the, the murder the murder site, even as it reenacts the beauty of that place. It's all in that same, all in the same place in the poem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joy. I was just thinking about um, this quote from James Baldwin that was recently mentioned somewhere, um, as it should be all the time, that uh, um, not everything that <coughs> face can be changed, but nothing can be changed unless it is faced. Mm -hmm. And um, I think about poetry as a way, it's a language that enables us to really face things in a multidimensional way. That some languages, some other aspects of language, even just pro, you know, how we're talking right now doesn't always quite get at or needs a different kind of length of time to get at. But there's something about the compression of poetry and the way that it um, challenges us to see different dimensions of things, to see interconnectivities of things, not just through using metaphorical language, but through kind of associations um, and bringing memories in and triggering sounds and smells and all the senses, we feel something. And so this is a way of facing, like truly facing, not just addressing it, um, but seeing it with our face, both forward looking and backward looking. Um, and so in that way, I think poetry is an apt language for justice and for social change, because it allows that kind of change to happen. It's like seeing with your spirit. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I, when you asked that question, um, I also immediately thought, well, what led me to think about words for social justice? And you know, that I uh, watched a lot of TV as a kid, um, and I don't know if any of you remembered uh, the story of Emile Zola and Jacques Hughes. Um, I watched, I was probably 11, it was an old movie at the time, but the poetry of I Accuse, he was, he was um, um, writing this uh, chant to the newspapers about um, uh, uh, Alfred Dreyfus, and that stuck has stuck with me all my life. I've looked it up. I've I've thought a lot about that language and the power of um, that. I accuse the repetition of that, and it linked as a kid. It linked me to my grandmother's stories of what happened to the land, what happened to our people. And <clears throat> those kinds of things, I think those events, those, those events of justice, seeking justice, those events uh, for Native people um, of being removed from our land, they really influenced um, people, in, especially in the Southeast, but everywhere, everywhere. Um, to use language, <clears throat> this heightened language, um, to seek justice, compassion for the things that have happened. And, and the Osage murders, it makes perfect sense that this new collection 
<clears throat> is a way to get at that things that are not spoken, the, the injustices. And um, I, I can't imagine not using the sacred language of poetry um, to talk about um, justice. I know Philip Carroll Morgan in his poem in, uh, in this anthology is using Choctaw as a, and a chant to get at certain issues. So poetry, only poetry can do this. And I'm a fiction writer, but poetry can um, infuse other people um, in ways that I don't think uh, uh, another genre can. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, okay. you used a, f a phrase that I am very curious, and, and there are certain sort of positioning that's very visual, where you talk about sort of like looking forward and looking backward. Um, and I think you might have used the word in scene. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and can you just say a little bit more about that? Because I'm very curious about this, not only in your work, but also in the work of those that are presented in, in the anthology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for asking. Um, well, I've, I've just, I write a lot and think a lot about images um, and image is really important to my work as a poet. And also I'm just compelled by imagery and poetry, um, but particularly the kind of imagery that um, really can't be depicted or painted or photographed. It's the kind of image that you can't describe, you know, like the image of a dream. You can't really tell the story of that dream. You can't really say what that image is, but the poem somehow is able to create it. And so I think about it as the, um, the invisible image um, and an image that is both visible, but it's inside visibility. Um, and it makes me think of insight. You know, when we have insight, we have intuition all these things that are about the interior knowledge, which is not on the surface level. So I, I like thinking about in seeing um, as like making active insight. Um, so it's not something you have, I don't own insight, but I'm in the process of in seeing, I can choose to be in the process of in seeing as a way of being in the world. And I think that's how I am in writing poems. I'm trying to see inside um, and, and also it's the, it's being able to see through the layers and layers of narratives that have, especially oppressive narratives that have dominated lands and peoples that have created injustices. Um, so, um, and I, and I, I think within this anthology, I mean, there, this is an anthology of such a vast array of poets that are all different. You know, the common thread is that poets are uh, members of Native nations and several other threads. But, you know, ultimately we're all in different people, different cultures, different identities, different ways of being poets, different means of language. Um, but I do see as a, as a kind of commonness through many of the poems, an engagement with in seeing. And maybe that's because I see that in any poem, you know, the nature of poem is in seeing, I think, but particularly because so much of the work as of poets from this <clears throat> land where so much of our memories, cultures, languages is so, you know, attempted to be erased, we have to work that much harder to see um, and to remind other people to see, not just their stereotype um, of what they think they should see. Um, I, I like that the homonym for insight is I-N-C-I-T-E. Oh yeah. <laughs> Which goes yeah. along with it, like insight, it becomes the activation. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's so great. that you're inciting with that your... That is exciting. Insight. Actually, if you think about that, I hadn't made that connection. That's very cool. Yeah, it struck me that for some reason that way. And I thought, that's boy, you could really play, you know, yeah. go with that. Mm -hmm. And inciting can be a very positive thing, kind of to incite the blooming, to incite the knowledge and the recollection. To insight the insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Packing that, I just was really fascinated by that and I wanted to know more. Um, 
it's really obvious. We've talked about sort of the anthology beginning with the land um, and, and the, this idea of, of place. And I just wanted to know, um, I can't even imagine taking on, putting together an anthology this, this, this big um, of such importance. And I wanted to know like, what type of considerations did you have to, how, how did you even begin to think about it? And, and how did it kind of move forward in a way that you felt kind of did all of these different places justice, if you will? Well, it started, I'll start this off because I have been in conversation for a few years. I mean, not constant, but I had, I had been thinking that we had no Norton anthology of native literature. And then I would think, but where would we even start? So, but I still ran it by them. I ran it by them and my editor, Jill, went to the college, talked to the college uh, rep, rep there and she said, well, We've thought about that, but we cannot, there's no way we could pay all the permissions, which doesn't totally make sense to me, but they didn't think they would get their, you know, they would reap a profit after paying permissions. <laughs> but she said, we would love to have a Norton anthology of native poetry. <coughs> so I had to think about it, but I was, te I was teaching that time at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. They'd given me an assistant uh, they'd given me, I had wonderful students and I looked around and I thought, hmm. So I went to my department chair and asked if I could teach two of my graduate classes as how to put together native literature. They were on native literature and how to put together a Norton anthology. And they would work with me through the process. And so the first class was giving them, I had sent a proposal into Norton and that's how it started. And then, you know, and I would work with, the, I was talking with the class, okay, well, this is, it starts with the land. So then we thought, you know, laid it out in terms of the land. And then um, I got the contract and then I asked Leanne to come on. I got together and uh, I decided that each of the regions needed, you know, we needed that our, I guess the decision was to, all of the Norton anthologies I'd seen, you know, they have, you know, the experts, the panels of experts, all the editors, usually there's quite a number of, you know, of experts. I thought, well, and, and I thought, thought about it. I thought, well, we're all, why not? We have a lot of incredible native poets. Our experts are all gonna be all native poets. We have a lot of other, you know, non-natives who've been excellent with native literature. And I, you know, I thought about that. And I thought, no, this will be all native poets. And that was important. So with those first classes, uh, you know, we would pull together and have Sky Skype meetings. This is be BZ before Zoom. We'd have Skype meetings <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, with the different editors from say mountains and plains editors. So that was great for the students too, but it kind of started that way where we talked, we were in discussions about you know, about our different areas, discussions that covered all the aesthetics, what it would look like. We had to f put in a little fight to get more than 300 pages. Mm. That was the first uh, contract offered us for 300 pages. And it's like, wait a minute, we have like 570 something uh, federally recognized tribes. Uh, they're state recognized. Some of them are legit, many of them are not. And we're 300 pages, and this is supposed to be like from time immemorial to the present, <laughs> you know, of North America and the island specific. How how do we do this? I mean, it's a, it was a big undertaking. So it took um, working with um, the different, just working with each geographical area team, and then all of us weighing in until we found, you know. We, we worked together through, uh, and we worked together and Jennifer started out as one of the um, contributing editors, we call them. And um, she was absolutely, it was very, became very obvious that she was part of the, the, the team. Uh, yeah, the, the hardcore center of the, the team, you know, too. So. She was essential too, I yeah. think. Yeah, nicely. You know, <clears throat> made the triangle. Yeah. 
think. Yes, we're all Muskogee and we're all Muskogee. Right. Yeah. Right. All women. <laughs> that has been noted. Negative. Yeah. <laughs> you know, negatively, because we did we have we did work to try to get a balance. <clears throat> You know, within the, you know, every, every team of editors work to try to get a balance in between, you know, within their, their group. Somebody asked me, somebody asked me yesterday or today about the balance between male and female writers. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty balanced, but I don't remember mm -hmm. uh, any numbers. But we did work to I remember get looking at it. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. part of the discussion. Yeah, it was part of it. So there are a lot of, we could have uh, made one three times as thick, three or four times as thick. So that was the difficulty is that we had to, um, you know, there are, there are people and poems left out we would have loved to have included. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that any anthology is ever definitive, especially one where we've got, you know, it's, this is just a, a it gives you a sampling, so to speak. It gives you a sense. I think, I think it, I think it's successful in that you do get a sense of, of the, the, the comprehensiveness of the, you know, of, of, of our presence, yeah. of our presence in, in the field of American poetry and in with, even within our own communities. We were so fortunate to have <clears throat> all these powerful, powerful voices and that it, within the regions. And, um, <clears throat> it, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I just think that they, the groups from those regions also were fairly comprehensive and uh, it made the, the work really a joy. I think we have to remember that sometimes these um, <clears throat> organizations or groups um, have, have had to work through some conflicts. That is not what happened with this work. We, uh, from my memory, um, we worked together, had meetings, um, and the people brought a good heart, a good, a good way into those discussions. And I think it, it's amazing to look back on a lot of those meetings, the gatherings, the, the, the work it was, um, people brought their, their good heart into the project. And I think it shows in the text. I agree. I mean, I think that one of the things that I thought a lot about <clears throat> Uh, it was just about community. It just created a community on the page, um, which I, I loved. Um, my next question has to do with, you know, the, the institute that we're creating over um, at the Poetry Center. And um, our theme for the Fall Institutes is how imaginative language and poems can help create a sense of belonging. And I know we've talked a little bit about justice, community, and connectedness, but can you share um, a little bit more about what that means to you as I, you just, just, just as writers of, of what that means? Man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where do we start in the history of it, of all of it? The sense of belonging in a, it's so strange, the sense of belonging in, in a country that, you know, sort of, you look at indigenous literature and indigenous peoples, you know, who are the root of, you know, who are at the root of these, uh, the imagination of the land, and here we are, and and then we were disappeared, I, I say disappeared, using a term that, you know, probably came out of South America, you know, is, but we were essentially disappeared, you know, from, from um, history and from anything American, American literature, American poetry, uh, American American, because to, uh, to be present, you know, we're present as ghosts in a way. And yet we're absolutely essential. It's so it creates a very strange relationship, I think, a perverted 
yeah it becomes a very perverted relationship with uh you know to be there and not there and then the images of being there were savage heathen um without culture which is the opposite of the truth yeah language creates such ex has the possibility to create such exclusion um in one way, in so many ways, one way, for example, grammatically, um, just English grammar, for example, the way that it's set up creates exclusion. Um, it demands pronouns, you know, it excludes gender fluidity. I mean, there's so many levels where language is used in a manner that is excluding. And, um, and it's very difficult to innovate language in you know, I, I was a grant writer for 10 years. It's really hard to innovate the language of a grant, you know, because you need to make sense, you know. Um, but you can really innovate language and flex language to be inclusive in poetry. Um, it, it refuses the authority of ordinary meanings of things. And it refuses um, the dominant language that says this is right and this is wrong. This person does not belong. This person is not a part of America, a la da la. It refuses all of those gestures, those attempts to define and exclude. Um, no, it can. Um, and if it's a good poem, it does, I believe. Um, it, it opens up, it creates a different kind of legibility. Um, and I like to think of, you know, I mean, when I, I remember once a friend told me a story, like his daughter had told her told her some story about like seeing a, seeing a bird in the sky and the way that it was told was so poetic. And listening to her as if this girl is a poet, you can hear that she's talking about so much more than this bird in the sky. She's mm -hmm. talking about all kinds of states of being and her perception of things and all a range of emotions. And the language of poetry allows that her insight to not be flattened it allows it to thrive and grow and poetry is always changing. It's always growing. Every time you read a poem, it changes. It's never flattened to a singular meaning. So all of that I think translates on a social level to be why poetry can um, create. I like this phrase that you have through the radical belonging. I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and poetry really can create that on really just a, a craft level. Well, it can get down to, it, you, you can talk intimately across generations. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a memoir, well, I've got, I'm doing tweaking right now, that will be a memoir that will be out from Norton in the next fall, next September. And there's a scene in there where I'm listening to reading in the closet where I would hide um, Emily Dickinson, and I have my knees up and the poetry between my knees, sitting there with my knees and thinking of her on the other end of time through time talking to me as if she were sitting there like a kid almost like a kid because the poem spoke to me in that way and poetry can work that way even though my image of a poet at that time she was probably one of the few females they were all of these i always saw i always saw poets as old white men living in england or or, <laughs> or yeah, living or the east coast of the united states where it rained all the time that was my image but to have that poem, but yet the poems could speak to me intimately. But I always remember Emily Dickinson's voice mm. as being, it was a doorway. <laughs> you know, it was, it, it was a, how lonely, like a, how lonely, like a frog. And it's like, what does that mean? It doesn't matter because it gives me, so it gives me a place for loneliness to perch, you know, in this bog of, of terror and, and mm -hmm. that I live in, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and that's that's the power. It, it, you talk about radical belonging. Everybody wants to belong. I mean, that's even at the root of our at, at our very um, desperate and poor leader. There's a everybody wants to belong in some ways. They want to belong in their families. Mm -hmm. They want to belong with each other. They want to feel like they have a place. And that's where we get into trouble is when people feel separated, mm -hmm. and they feel like they don't belong, or they're made to feel like they don't they, they don't belong, or to or to belong means that you have to destroy someone else. 
you know, and so then I think that's why we've all been coming, the world's been coming to poetry or it appears to be coming to poetry during this time is because there's a place to belong in the midst of revolution, in the midst of terror, in the midst of uh, the earth destruction, in the midst we, we come to it to find a place, okay, I can belong in this poem and in this poem I can hold it, I can memorize it, I can hold it in here, I can carry it around with me and um, I can go back to it. I'm nobody, who are you? And nobody too. <laughs> that makes two of us, you know, from a little kid. Mm -hmm. you know, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest. <laughs> all have anything that you wanted to share um i have one last quick question uh for joy before we close up but is there anything that you wanted to either speak about or share or ask one another uh be before i head to the finale i just wanted to say how that i express appreciation for everyone's work on this anthology because it's um, every time I look at or read it, I mean, it's 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 a uh, it do, doing part of this work was um, an honor to be able to serve. You know, I think we're all in service. Poets are in service. Um, we're in service to the place beyond words, and then to be able to come together and serve in in compiling this which, you know, there's the works of so many people in so many different lands and so many generations. This is cross-generational. And it's like when you hold it, there's, it's just like what a poem can hold. You can hold it. There's grief in here. There's immense sorrow. There's joy. There's hilarious, you know, some of the poets are hilarious. It's all, you know, history. There's so much history wound, winding through here. It's American history. You know, it's world history. It's intimate tribal histories that are through here. And so it's to be able to be part of this, to be called on to be part of this is, to me, it's a great honor to help bring this, bring this here, you know, to say that, yes, we, this is a, tech, a testament of radical belonging, you know, we, we 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 belong we belong here we're um our words belong here and they're you know it gives me even more respect of you know the it's there's an ancestral belonging that is here that is part of american ancestry too i think whoever you are you know in american poetry this is part of your ancestry right here mm -hmm. Thank you, Joy. I also think that the I also think that the uh, the book called us. We didn't call it like a like a story calls itself into being, like a poem calls itself into being and calls the people to it. It feels to me like the book called itself. And we are, as Joy just said, we're in service to, to that, those works, those words, those people. I don't feel like, I mean, for, I, and I'm speaking only for myself, I feel like I am in service to this, this work. Um, and and that, that it, it, it is sacred in its, it's compilation as well. Thank you, Leanne. Um, so, so Joy, I have one last question that I'll sort of close with, and it's more of just out of a curiosity, and it's less sort of intellectual. I just wanted to know what you know. You 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 spoke about this time when you were eating berries and whale meat. And I wanted to know what the whale meat tasted like. <laughs> whale meat. Like, it on my mind. Good. Like, I, I just want to know everything a poet to describe that to me, um, wh what that was like. Um, I, I can imagine it, but I'm really interested in sort of like hearing more about that. 
It tastes like it tasted like Northern Ocean. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it tasted like the the ocean. I love the oceans up there. I love flying over them. I like. I don't know. It's I have a connection. I feel always feel connected to that part of the world. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I don't make no sense at all, but I do, and I love the poetry up that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you all um, for being here and for taking time and for you know just sort of working with us on this because we're so honored to have the three of you, um, including Bojan. Um, to just be part of this to launch our institute. I'm just going to hold up the book for people. Um, if you have not already um, purchased this book, um, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, a Northern Anthology of Native Nations Poetry. Please get this. Um, and I just want to say good night to everyone. And I just am, am in gratitude for all that you've done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.